Так, шановні друзі, ради вітати в наших гостинних і величних стенах Київського політехнічного інституту імені Ігоря Сікорського. Попри негоду і катаклізми, ради, що жага, знань, нових ідей, нового досвіду перемогла негоду. І маю велику приємність представити нашу сьогоднішню лекторку, яка вже не перший раз виступає в стінах нашого інститута. Інституту – це Джесіка Зихович. Вона зараз є фулбрайтівським науковцем, старшим фулбрайтівським науковцем в Україні, викладає курс Києв-Малянській академії в Сполучених Штатах, є науковим співробітником Центру вивчення нових демократій в Мічиганському університеті. Привітаємо Джесіку. І... Тема сьогоднішнього виступу Джесіки буде присвячена проблематиці модернів, тобто спроєктовані модерни в цифрову епоху. Власне, ти тематика, проблематика, якою опікується наша кафедра, і тим більше буде цікавий погляд нашої американської колеги. Джесіка, кілька слів про Джесіку. Джесіка має PhD з антропології, ну, знаєте, що в спеціалі, в Сполучених Штатах антропологія – це дисципліна, вельми соціологізована, ну, до якоїсь міри можна вважати її таким собі відгалудженням соціології. Ну, в нашій країні в тому, в такій формі антропологія поки ще не розвинена, але також в процесі динамічному розвитку. Тому подвійна цікавість виступу Джесіки, лекції Джесіки, що вона є представницею такої спорідненої дисципліни, яка має перспективу розвитку і в нашій країні. І таке дуже приземлене питання, чи потрібно перекладати лекцію Джесіки? Чи будемо практикувати англійську мову? Будемо практикувати? Добре. Джесіка, the floor is yours. Добрий день. Дуже дякую за запрошення. I am very honored to be here, and today I hope that all of you are staying warm in this uh, Michigan weather, because we have that in common for, sh for sure. This is definitely February. And I really, really um, want to say how excited I am to be in Ukraine at this moment in time and connecting with your generation, because you are such an inspiration to the world. Maybe it's hard to see from the other side, but in America, I have two younger sisters your age, and they ask me all the time, what is it like there? What is Ukraine like? Um, because I've been coming here to your country and researching and studying for many years, and I've watched things change a lot since the Orange Revolution, right? You've had two revolutions in 10 years and your generation has been part of both of them. So I hope to learn from you. And today I will present some ideas that I have and I'm really excited to hear your thoughts because I'm still working through some concepts, uh, right? Modernity usually is one singular word, but modernity is plural. Mm, it's imaginative. I'm trying to draw our attention today to imagination, how we imagine ourselves in the world, in society, and how others see us, um, which is part of what I'm working on um, related to democracy and political creativity. Uh, these are terms not my own. So I am borrowing the term political creativity from a professor of political science, Misha Minakov, at Kiev Mohila Academy, where I am teaching right now in the Department of Sociology. So that is another thing that I want to share with you today is what I am doing here right now. Why am I in Ukraine at this moment and, and what am I doing over at Kiev Mohila? So I am a researcher primarily, and I'm working on a new project that 
I was very, very, very lucky and blessed to receive support for from the Fulbright program, which is an amazing program that started in uh, the 1960s. 60s uh, and started in Ukraine in 1991. So this year is the 25th anniversary of the program. And I invite all of you to come to the Fulbright office for different talks and events and discussions. It's free and a great way to meet other Fulbrighters from uh, different cities and uh, universities in the United States. And you too can have an opportunity to apply to Fulbright because they have lots of uh, levels. Not only professors, but students can go to the United States to uh, research and study. So my research project with Fulbright this year is connected to the history of computers and the history of the internet. But I am not a computer scientist. I am more interested in culture and how we relate to each other through technology, through the internet. Social media is a word that many of you have heard in relation to the Arab Spring and the color revolutions, not only in Ukraine, but also other parts of the world. Yet political scientists, anthropologists, sociologists, are revisiting social media as a term and revisiting technology and its relationship to politics. So I want to provide you with a little bit of context. The Freedom House Index is a great uh, resource for measuring development around the world because they uh, have wonderful, wonderful data from maybe 200 countries, and they collect this data every two to five years. So it's usually pretty current. And all of you I know are writing projects in your courses, so maybe this can be a resource for you when you are looking at different uh, measurements of either uh, financial and economic development, social development, but in terms of the internet, they have done a lot of work on internet freedom. Svobodnis po interneti. What does that mean? Well, in the Freedom House Index definition, uh, it is comprised of access to the internet and also um, management of resources online. So here you can see for 2017, last year, Ukraine is listed as partly free. And within this uh, listing, you have an overall score of 45 out of 100. Out of all the countries, 200 countries that were surveyed, Ukraine is about halfway to free, free internet. Um, the obstacles to access are very low because actually Ukraine has a lot of access to the internet. There are 120 subscriptions per 100 users, which means there is a surplus of access. So that's not really the problem. Uh, and part of the reason access is so good here is because Ukraine has the cheapest internet in the world. Um, it's, it's very expensive in some countries relative to what people uh, make in their income for them just to be able to have the internet. So Ukraine is doing great with access. Limits on content, there, the score is 15, or sorry, 16 out of 35. So there are some limits on what websites you can access from the Ukrainian internet, but that's not really the problem either, just because you have right now, you're able to access lots of, of websites. Things are not blocked. And violations of user rights, you are at about 20 out of 40. So this is more of an issue and part of the reason that the internet usage here is not free is because users of the internet sometimes don't know their rights 
privacy rights, for example, how your information is shared or used by government or by companies. This is part of education. So uh, all of you being here at the technical university, you are leaders in educating yourselves and your communities about the internet. So you are the future of a free, freer internet in Ukraine. The global standing of internet usage is about 35% of countries are not free, um, 29 partly free category, 24% uh, are free, so, and 12% have not been uh, studied or assessed. So basically, only 25% of countries in the world have internet freedom. Freedom meaning access, knowing and protecting their rights, and free flow of content or management of content. And we'll speak about that a little bit later. So what I'm speaking about also with relation to freedom, we can use a, a different and more advanced term to describe this dynamic, and that is the digital divide. Some of you probably have heard of this term already. It's a combination of factors that can be social, economic, educational, cultural, that create differences in how people are using uh, digital tools to empower themselves. So this is a map that includes, as you can see, um, libraries, employment, public education, politicians, um, and profit organizations, and also some corrections to the system like um, security or police. So there's a network, an entire network and web of information on how the internet is um, creating some barriers or, or creating some uh, facilitators to help or to work against people's everyday lives and their ability to uh, have equality with other citizens in their society. The other aspect of this um, digital divide, which in Ukraine is really interesting to study because as I showed you with the Freedom House uh, measurements, you have this question of content, of management, of uh, basic sort of access to subscriptions of scientific journals. That is a, one a really good example, I think, that's relevant for universities, where internationally some countries have access to information that other countries do not. This is a question of piracy, for example, um, and profit, and oftentimes is really difficult to form partnerships between businesses and government on this question. And in the United States right now, we, we have a lot of debate about net neutrality. This is an, another key term connected to digital divide. What net neutrality is, is also about flow of content, how much bandwidth someone is paying for from a business um, can give them more use or more uh, flow of content in their subscription. This was not always the case. Um, in, in the past, there were laws that um, put all businesses on more of an equal playing field on the internet so that you didn't have one group ahead of another. So you're seeing now lots of debate about class inequality and access connected to financial barriers, social barriers, and cultural barriers. And that's what the new digital divide involves. So in Ukraine, I know from my own research and my colleagues that you depend on, uh, you have to depend on sometimes pirated resources in order to do your research, to find 
academic books published in English is difficult here because institutions have financial barriers to academic journal subscriptions that, uh, or even to international library loan systems because the, the content and the flow and the management of internet materials is not legal and supported by government. So the issue internationally is becoming more critical in Ukraine because in the next few years, um, internet providers here have no incentive to not to close pirate sites. So as they start closing free tour sites for movies or um, everything from you know, apps or um, you know, platforms for uh, Instagram or Snapchat the, or even uh, Microsoft Word, these software and other programs that Ukraine, many people depend on, um, the pirated versions, they're going to go away. And when this happens, it's going to create, if it happens, and it looks like it will, it's going to create some isolationism, like to, to make it more difficult to hear for people to have access to research materials, to PDFs of books that you need to read in order to be educated and knowledgeable, it's a problem. And it's part of this digital divide. And around the world, we see um, holes you know, in the system, information uh, vacuums, let's say, empty spaces where people cannot access information because they don't have internet freedom. So it's an important thing to think about um, in international terms because there are really important organizations working on this problem. Ukraine is not alone in this issue. Um, the UN created a set of goals called the Millennium Development Goals, and they include in this set of goals, which they started in 2012, and they said, okay, by 2015, we want to meet all of these development goals around the world. Number eight is technology. Number eight also involves internet freedom, access and content management. And within this framework, every two or three years, they reassess whether they are meeting these goals. By 2015, I went and I checked um, just recently because my students at Kiev Mohila are also actively learning about this topic with me. And I wanted to see if they met the goals in 2015, and they did not. <laughs> so the report on uh, Millennium Development Goal Number 8, which involves technology, shows that there's been a lot of investment into the problem, uh, but not a lot of returns. So it's becoming a little critical. Um, now that brings me back to my theoretical frame. I've given you a lot of information, a lot of facts, but what does it mean in the larger context of researching politics? Politics, political science, political theory, uh, rights, studying rights, uh, these are changing, right? The technologies we use, even how we are voting, in the US, we have a lot of debate about our electoral system. Um, as you know, because of the elections, there's investigation happening into uh, how our electronic networks actually changed our elections. Is this the best way to conduct democracy? Should we have something in addition to the electoral ballot, is there a better way to choose our leaders? This is uh, my question about modernities. And I put here a crossroad, and all of these signs have nothing written on them. <laughs> so we are standing at a crossroads. We have to make decisions about these things. But there's no word to describe what 
we mean when we talk about digital democracy. This idea was uh, piloted in the 90s and uh, a lot of the politicians in the US who were working on this, um, Al Gore was one of them, they had very um, specific incentives, motives in the 90s to be working on this question because they were also connected to profit generating companies like Google who were starting to um, increase and expand their networks and their users in the US because a lot of users in the US didn't get onto the internet until the late 90s. Most people in the 90s did not have internet access. There was America Online, AOL, and a few other service providers, but most people didn't need the internet at that time. Now, we all need the internet, and everybody here, I'm sure, has a mobile phone with internet on it. Around the world, mobile technology is out, outpacing all other technologies, but how do we conceive of digital democracy? What does that really mean? Um, I like to do things with words. As J.L. Austin, the linguist, wrote that going back into the history of a word, very often into Latin, we come back pretty commonly to pictures or models of how things happen or are done. So communication is one of the primary, probably the number one function of the internet that civil society uses. That in a democracy, and if we're thinking about digital democracy, communication on the internet is extremely um, important for us to consider if we are leveraging equality between citizens to make choices about their lives, to make choices about how they want their country to look like or how they want or how you want your future to be. Um, when I'm thinking about modernity also, I'm thinking about not only the good sides of what we call um, information networks because we also have to consider the problems that we are facing. Right now we have this word in English, fake news, and here I'm very aware of the initiative Stop Fake. I know several Fulbrighters who are working with this group in Ukraine, and it's really important because all of you have to find ways to um, have quality information so you can interpret for yourself what events are going on. Uh, you can also, by thinking more critically about your information, you can start to change the type of uh, perspectives that you have on modernity. So what I'm getting at basically with modernities is Technology is wrapped always with war. The development of the internet is also the history of the military. In the United States, uh, the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, was the first place where the internet was being um, invented in the 1950s and 60s. Here in the Soviet Union, it was Kiev. The first computer in the Soviet Union was um, the MESM, MESM, and you can go and see it in Kiev. You can visit it. It's a giant computer. It's almost as big as this stage. It's in its own room, but this room is now a monastery. So it's kind of ironic that <laughs> the site of the first computer is now a monastery, but it's a fascinating place, and Kiev is a fascinating place for understanding this history because it's not only about science, it's also about culture. It's about how America and the U USSR spoke to each other. It's about communication and about language. Um, the internet was not managed completely inside of the US military. We also had people in California working 
at um, Stanford and Santa Barbara on how to send an email. And the first email was in the world was sent from Stanford to UC Santa Barbara, the university, and it was L-O, that was the only word in the email, L-O, because the scientist who was sending it couldn't type login fast enough. That's what they wanted to write, was login. So it was just L-O. But what I am illustrating here is that the competition between business and Department of Defense, the Pentagon in the US, this drove a lot of innovation and a lot of um, new ideas in the development of the internet. But it also created a culture. In California, the first um, job that Steve Jobs had, um, along with Wozniak, who doesn't get mentioned as often as Steve Jobs, but he's just as important in the development of the internet, was at Atari games, Atari video games. And out of video games actually came a lot of the interfaces that we use to communicate every day. We don't think about it when we log into our computer and we see uh, the, the screen and we have certain buttons to press. We don't really think about the design behind these things, but there are people and stories and ideas and politics behind every single part of the interface that you use every day without thinking about it. Another kind of interesting anecdote on this point is that in the Soviet Union, there were fierce debates about whether we should use the word memory or not to describe a computer. Should we say, my computer's memory, we will store, you know, 2,000 files. Well, this was controversial because people did not, um, not all of the scientists and politicians especially um, believed that hu humans were, could be, these words could link humans and machines. That metaphors for computers that we use to talk about computers today, the metaphors we use are actually human metaphors. Memory, my computer is thinking, talking. We talk about our computers like they are humans or robots. And this was a political debate in the Soviet Union because um, the idea was that it could be connected somehow with the structure uh, and the ideas of fascism. That if you start talking about a person like a, like a machine, that then you are dehumanizing that person. But eventually the metaphors changed and became uh, linked to uh, the genome and experiments in um, mapping cells and developing cells and the whole structure in uh, the Institute of Cybernetics was not only about the uh, function of a computer, but it was an imagined society, imaginary idea that you could take a computer or the definition of a computer is not just a personal computer that you use that has, as I said, interfaces from Atari and all these other games, Nintendo from Japan, but a computer is any machine that can calculate or process information. So computers run our cities. All of the lights that you see um, in the street that control the cars, red, green, go, stop, these are all done by computers. And underneath the city, there's an invisible city. And it's an infrastructure of electronic information. And this infrastructure developed out of the imagination of cybernetics scientists working in Kiev, Moscow, primarily. They were brilliant mathematicians, brilliant. And they thought they could optimize a society to self-correct so that you wouldn't have a 
grid malfunction or economic breakdown. And the idea was a little bit different in the US. So there were similar imagined uh, ideas of management that you would, you would have a grid that would self-correct, but it was based in uh, obviously capitalist competition and the Soviet Union and the US were definitely politically uh, you know, working sometimes against each other in developing the internet, but they were also collaborating. Scientists would go back and forth between the Soviet Union and the US, and the internet was not, it was, um, had a dual function of both dividing civilizations and bringing them closer together because it was used in development of weapons, but it was also used in the development of communication and scientific uh, advancement, mathematic, mathematical advancement. So it's complex if we start to study the internet in international relations, we can understand something about today, about what is going on today in global affairs and in, in international relations, because a lot of the uh, web that we use, it's not floating somewhere in the sky like a ghost, it's connected to these grids that are underlying our cities. The electricity that we require for the internet is a physical thing. It's a geographical thing. It has servers, it has specific locations, and your information is also geographical. So if your computer tells the grid that you are in Kiev, then you are going to be there like a passport, right? So it's not anonymous. And for this reason, it's also really important for you to remember to use antivirus software and to protect your information. Because as more and more people use the internet, it's, it's really more and more of a, of a public place. And it is a public. So when we think about uh, the history of cybernetics, I, I include a social graph because you not only have scientists who were working as mathematicians, but you also have authors, you have writers, you have, for example, Asimov, the famous um, Russian uh, sci-fi author. Uh, sci-fi is, is connected with the cultures of early internet developers, game developers. In California, especially in San Francisco, you have an entire subculture dedicated just to sci-fi. And for me, I'm really interested in this topic because of my brother. My brother is an engineer. And when I was about 15 years old, I watched him build a computer by himself. He, he bought all of the different pieces, the motherboard, you know, the, even like the, um, some of the wires, he rewired the motherboard. And I thought, wow, that is so cool. I want to do that. But at that time, it wasn't really encouraged for women to be involved with hard sciences. So I didn't, I didn't. My brother was the one in our family who got to be the computer guy. And I really wanted to learn. So later on, I, I started taking computer classes. And I went to Vancouver, Canada, and spent the summer there learning about uh, cybernetics and culture of computers in, with many women and men as well. But it was more gender balance at that time because uh, they deliberately wanted to include women. So this is also kind of an interesting part if we're thinking about culture of computers. There are some great, great initiatives in the US happening right now for women in science and young women who want to get involved with this. So one really famous initiative is called Girls Who Code, and it's about writing code and there are online clubs that you can join for free with this group all around the world. You can connect with them and they will teach you over, over Skype or different platforms how to code and not only code for 
basic computer functions because maybe you don't really want to build a computer like my brother did because you can find better uses for your time today. But what you can do some, with some of these code programs is create creative projects. Like you can make a movie or you can make a soundtrack or you can also with some um, animating devices make something light up in a way like uh, fa for fashion design this is becoming popular to have like clothing that has computers in it sewn into the clothing. Why would you want a computer in your clothing? Well, there are different creative applications for that. And this is also connected with the internet of things, right? The internet of things that now when we are online, sometimes we're not even aware of it. Like our phone, our mobile phone is online automatically, or maybe we have a watch with internet or um, some other device but this is kind of how our world is functioning now with internet all around us working and positioning us in space and time. And you can look to the future and think of utopias, but we're not going to do that today because it's not utopian either to have the internet of things. And there's been great uh, analyses by uh, thinkers like Liz Losh, who is one of the people at this conference or the seminar in Vancouver that I was at, Liz Losh, Losh she writes about education and the internet and how uh, some barriers have arisen with the internet of things that now we have so much information, sometimes we forget the difference between education and knowledge, or we do not appreciate human teaching enough and we rely too much on small bits of information or maybe um, interpreting things ourselves because we think if we sign on to an online course, we don't need to ask any questions. It will automatically answer our questions in the Q&A section. This type of thinking is getting away from what education is supposed to do. And I think a lot of the culture of the internet can have a negative side in this way um, because we forget the social components of learning and there are better applications, more, um, I think, constructive applications of some of these learning programs and that is, a big interest of mine because I'm in the sphere of education. And speaking about education and origins of political creativity, which was the term that I started with today, and I use that term from Misha Minakov's recent book about Ukraine, After Maidan. But I am speaking from the American context and for me, my inspiration also when I think about political creativity is the story of the civil rights movement in the US. Because right now I know Ukraine is going through a really, really hard time. And the war in the East is a constant presence here and, and something that I try to remember when things are difficult is the people that fought for what I have. That in the American context, the civil rights leaders from the 1960s, what they did for us, what they did for me and my generation, is they gave me a language. They gave me words to describe rights and my experiences. And this picture here is of a really critical moment in the civil rights uh, movement in the US. It was in 1957. This was the first black woman to go to university in the US. And what happened behind the story, it's really interesting, um, three years pri prior to this moment, the Supreme Court ruled that schools should be integrated. So 
the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. said every university in America has to let black people in because they were all white prior to that. And in this ruling, they said the university at Little Rock will be the first university to let a black person in. And what happened was the local um, voting districts, they gerrymandered the districts, so basically they cheated <laughs> the leaders at that time. And they said, no, we are not going to let any black people in these schools. And there is an organization, it's still an organization called the NAACP. It's the National African American uh, organization. And these leaders, they were connected to Martin Luther King, one of my heroes. And they decided we are going to integrate the schools ourselves. So we're looking for volunteers who are gonna go and be brave and go to school, um, even though the local leader said no. And this young girl, um, Elizabeth Eckford, she volunteered to be the first black woman to go to school, and she did, but it was a very traumatic experience for her because she was attacked, and then she had to leave that day, so she, know, she was not successful. She didn't get into the university. However, um, the president of the United States at that time, Dwight Eisenhower, he overruled the, the local leaders, and he said, yes, I'm going to take her to school. So he ordered the 121st Airborne to escort her into the university. So they ended up being successful because they had the support of the president of the US. So they won. And now we have integrated schools. But these are the moments that I try to think about when I think about political creativity. And since that time, one of my favorite political philosophers, Hannah Arendt, she wrote about that moment in Little Rock, in Arkansas, when Elizabeth Eckford, the first black student, went to school. And this is what she wrote about that moment. Um, she wrote this in, 19, in the 1950s in the context of thinking about uh, the Nuremberg laws and the Eichmann trial and the post-World War II order. She wanted to think about how to make a better world for herself and her children, so she was interested in universities. And she said, Tož pedzujemo vyslovujúčes politično nedostatno skazate, šo vlada i nasilstva ne od ne i teže. Vlada i nasilstva je pro teležnostjami tam, de panuje od ne in še absolutno vidsutnje. So she's thinking about power and violence. Very heavy quote, right? This is a really um, intense moment, and she says violence and power are not the same. Not the same. That in her theory, power comes from collective will, comes from consensus, and it does not come from individuals attacking other individuals, that this is not power, that's violence. It's a little philosophical, but I like to really uh, return and think, return to this when I am thinking about political creativity and when I'm thinking about the internet and, and how technology is changing rights and civil rights and civil society. And Hannah Arendt, I recommend all of you to read her, her writing because she was a major, major world figure. And if you're sociologists or anthropologists or p political scientists, I think she has something to offer everyone in these fields because she was living and writing at a time uh, when things were radically changing and she was traveling between New York and Germany quite a bit. She was Jewish and she was a German Jewish woman and her teacher, she found out in her university, Heidegger, philo famous philosopher, Heidegger maybe you've encountered him, um, he you know, had very complicated relationship to 
to Germany, to Nazi Germany, and she disagreed with him and his positions, and broke, she broke from him, and she developed her own thinking. And so I admire her for that also, because she did not just follow and agree with what her teacher told her. She came up with her, new, uh, her own idea. And if you want to know the story of her life, I really, really encourage you to see the film. It's a German film made about her and it was made only three, two or three years ago. So it's a new film and it's excellent. There's excellent acting and it gives you also a lot of sort of background for her book. So when you read her books, you'll know something about her. And the last slide that I wanted to show is a art piece from Trafalgar Square in London. This is a empty monument, basically. Right now in the US, as I told you earlier, with uh, this moment in Little Rock, we are returning to the civil rights era. We have a lot of conflict right now in our civil society. We have a lot of um, ugly things being said between blacks and whites in, in my country. And this is, this is a time that we need to return in my, in my country. We need to return to the civil rights movement and what it meant. And people are doing that. And they are doing that through debate. Because of course, consensus is maybe what we want. We want power, we want to con agree together and have collective will. But we have a history that is different for each person. And sociology and history are connected, right? The way you interact with people is also to understand where they are from, where, where, what they believe in. And we have monuments throughout our country, like many, mostly in the South. And these are monuments to the, the Civil War. Uh, that happened in the US in the mid 19th century. And some people still believe that the Confederate monuments um, should remain from the Civil War. And there have been uh, a lot of these monuments taken down because some of the Confederate leaders owned slaves. So it's a coming to terms with the history of slavery also in my country that these monuments stood for. And I know since Maidan in Ukraine, there has been a lot of debate about these Lenin statues. Also, the Lenin statues are coming down. It's a very different context and totally different history than in the US. But there's a parallel, a parallel story, which is that in both your country and my country, we have monuments that we are thinking about for the next generation. What, are, what kinds of political creativity or what kind of society do you want to see for your children? And here, I like this art piece because it's empty, because it is an open space. You could have anything there. I think it is a symbol of the future that we have work to do. We have a lot of work to do because these are not easy questions and there's not only one answer. Another art, I like, I like art in political context for this purpose because it helps us to debate. Um, artists do not claim to make facts from history. So it opens us up to not just having one answer, but to debate these things and to, to come up with some, some understanding so that we can have a dialogue about our future. Um, so with that, I would like to hear what you think. Uh, so those, those are my ideas that I'm working on and I would love to share more with you about my students as well and what I'm doing at Kiev Mohila. So feel free to, to ask me um, whatever you would like to. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica, may I ask a 
question kind of dealing with your uh, conceptual framework or frame, uh, frame of references. Sure. You know, uh, what are the thinkers uh, who influence the most your thinking or approach uh, or interpretation of modernity? And I also mm -hmm. noticed mm -hmm. that you conspicuously employ the notion of uh, modernities in uh, plural. Mm -hmm. uh, have you been influenced by uh, Eisenstadt and his uh, school of thought on multiple modernities? Um, this is a new field for me, so I'm not familiar with Eisenstadt, no, no. And I recently have been encountering uh, modernity and modernities through my teaching in uh, sociology at Kiv Mohila. And one of the things that I have been thinking about is um, institutions as the rise and development of sociology as a field and also museums in the 20th century happens. The, this is a way of projecting a modernity or inventing a modernity. And in terms of other thinkers, I have been thinking more about um, more contemporary authors like Michael Warner's Publics and Counterpublics. He's not uh, foundational in sociology. He's a cultural historian, mm -hmm. but it's a different, different area. Yeah. Mm. And, and so. Quite exciting. Thank you. Sure. Друзі, питання, коментарі. Оскільки тема гаряча, актуальна і має високий ступінь такої релевантності і до наших реалій, тобто використання соціальних медіа в політичній боротьбі, в конструюванні політичного, політичній креативності. А тепер же ми маємо взагалі то і теж такий собі спектакль перед нашими очима, а саме це hacking of US elections. Again, what's your take on uh, all uh, this whole story? Uh, yeah. do you th uh, first of all, do you think that hacking uh, uh, did take place? And mm -hmm. if it did, uh, did it have a any influence uh, on the outcome of the election? Yes, yes, I like this question. Um, and I also like that you use the word spectacle because another thinker that is foundational for me is Guy Debord and his society of the spectacle and that you know, we, we all live on a screen after the rise of the television. Yes, I do think that hacking took place. I believe 100% and from the summer before the elections took place, I was worried about this because Obama was making statements about it. And investigations uh, since that time have shown uh, that there were already intelligence agencies in the U.S. who were tracking like uh, strange um, attempts to to enter into the grid, into the ballot boxes. So there was some awareness already before it happened. As far as you know, I I ascribe to I ascribe to this position. There are plenty of people who think it's a conspiracy theory. I think it's a conspiracy. <laughs> and I agree with um, mm -hmm. more or less with Mueller's methods in his investigation. Let, let and, just translate. Yeah. Uh, друзі, просто тут uh, невеличка, uh, я думаю, перекладацька допомога, яка буде не зайвою. Тобто Джесіка обігрує uh, слова, що uh, conspiracy theory, тобто змова uh, проти uh, реальної змови. Тобто багато хто вважає, що оце припущення про російське втручання в американські вибори президентські є так званою теорією змови. Тобто якоюсь фантастичною теорією, коли вигадується хтось, хто десь там за сценою, за лаштунками смикає за мотузочки і керує усіма і усім світом як маріонетками. І це називається conspiracy theory або теорія змови. Але сумніви і скепсис по відношенню до теорії змови не повинен затьмарювати те, що існують реальні змови. Тобто існують перевороти, існують втручання спецслужб, внутрішні справи інших країн. І Джесіка прибічниця того погляду, що це втручання реально мало місце російських тролів спецслужб mm -hmm. в американські президентські вибори. І, відповідно, маємо справу з фактом реальної реальної змови. Ну і, напевно, ви знаєте, що 
в Сполучених Штатах було призначено спеціального прокурора Мюллера вже певний час, майже одразу після інагурації Трампа в президенти, який, власне, і веде розслідування цієї, цієї справи, цих фактів. Ну і посада спеціального прокурора в Сполучених Штатах є надзвичайно такою пауфул, впливовою, тобто це та посадова особа, яка потім може зібраний матеріал подавати до Конгресу з метою стартування процедури імпічменту президента. Ну, зрозуміло, не все так просто і однозначно, як я описав, тому що і тепер в Сполучених Штатах у зв'язку із цим розслідуванням розгорнулася така інтенсивна юридична дискусія. Спеціальний цей прокурор, спешіал каунсел, він може, чи вона, ну, в даному випадку, він безпосередньо подавати матеріали своїх знахідок, свого розслідування до Конгресу і вимагати від Конгресу дій. Чи це має опосередковуватися керівництвом Департаменту юстиції, яке призначає президент? А якщо це має опосередковуватися керівництвом Департаменту юстиції, яке призначає президент, то зрозуміло, що тут ми можемо очікувати конфлікту інтересів і блокування потім дій з офіційної реакції на результати такого розслідування. Тому що, зрозуміло, посадова особа, яка призначена президентом, навряд чи буде сприяти якимось матеріалам, які компроментують президента, який, власне, цю посадову особу призначає і може потім звільнити з роботи. Тому mm -hmm. і теж ми бачимо, що в рамках американської системи, де начебто доволі розвинені ці механізми checks and balances, Маємо багато конфліктів, суперечностей, неоднозначностей і недопрацювань, тому що дійсно політичний процес – це процес креативний, і коли виникають, створюються, витворюються нові реалії, то інституції повинні пройти певний процес такого навчання, як з цими новими політичними реаліями, наслідками політичної креативності, яка може бути, до речі, і позитивною, і негативною. Та ж змова – це теж форма політичної креативності, тільки негативна, спрямована на руйнацію, на нанесення шкоди іншій стороні. Як з цими новими реаліями, новими політичними креативностями взаємодіяти, як їх інтерпретувати і, власне, що з ними робити? Так, я, я додаю трохи теж. Я, я сказала, що я маю інспірації про civil rights, цивільні праві з американського контексту і теж з України. Бо Ідея Майдану ще живе, я думаю. І що пройшло тут у нас зараз в Америці, після вибори, так, у нас е, багато людей, е, хто не задоволені з, з цими. І ми вірюємо, що е, це е, для нас теж це під час революційний. Все конфюст. Uh, заплутує. Заплутує, так. Але, можливо, є um, шанс бути позитивним і never to give up, right? Not to, to lose this idea. Because uh, I hear in the US many people tell me, oh, it's too complicated. I don't know anything about politics. I don't care. I have to be a doctor to understand what is happening now because it is so complicated. And I say, no, no, don't think that way. You have something to say too. And you are creative and you should be involved. And when I went to Maidan Memorial on February 18, which is my birthday, I saw all of the uh, exhibits for the future design of a museum, right, like 10 or 15 uh, designs. And I also saw memorials that were creative memorials involving art, involving the intersection of art and history. And this is inspiration. This is really something special in Ukraine to 
to be proud of. And in the US, we always are with you thinking about this, at least I am. So maybe I'm a little bit, uh, you know, excited for, for the future. But the question now, you know, is how to, to deal with the war. And that is something, it's an international problem. I don't think it's a Ukrainian problem alone. It's an international problem. It's a proxy war and connected to this issue with elections. So that is, that is what I perceive. Okay. Patanya, I want to hear something from А можна по українськи? Я роз я розумію по українськи. Ви як вихиваєте з маніпулятивних технологій? А тоді, якщо не важко до мікрофону. А це ж для запису. Пані Джесіко, таке питання. Ну, ми вже знайомі з вами. Як ви вважаєте, от що можна зробити, що можна зробити для вирішення проблеми маніпуляції саме ну, з вашої точки зору, щоб правильний вибір був все-таки на чергових виборах, навіть наших через рік? Як можна цьому зарадити? How to deal with the manipulations, uh, ah, uh, yes, so yes. we can we can make a right choice uh, during elections uh, because we have elections next year. Yes, yes. Basically, how to fight manipulations. I I have been reading an interesting book called The Great Regression. It is a collection of ten chapters by political theorists from ten countries and they are all writing about the outcome of the US election in this book, The Great Regression, it's excellent. I can make a PDF for you and, and send it to you. Um, but what one thinker here from Germany says, he asks, is the ballot box the best solution? He uses the example of uh, ancient Greece, and he talks about uh, the Athenian city-state of Greece, because the way elections were conducted there was through a small and random, smaller random set of people who, so everyone did not vote. Only a small percentage of society voted. And this was a random selection, so it's a little bit ideal, maybe, because that can be manipulated, too. But this uh, section of people in Athenian city-state, they were very educated on the issues. They spent lots of time before the elections learning and researching the issues. And then they made a decision. They voted. And then from this vote, um, the leader was chosen, and then there would be referendums by society on certain issues if they didn't agree with the outcome. And I think the referendum could be a useful uh, correction to elections, that that can be a, a way of involving more people who feel they don't have any voice. Um, I think the system is, right now, is functioning in a way where, as in America, you know, Trump did have people who voted for him. Yes, I believe the elections were hacked, but I also understand that there were legitimate votes in favor of Trump, many votes in favor of Trump. How to explain this? He had, well, I think one reason, he had a lot of what's called earned media. So his media campaign was totally different than Hillary Clinton. Hillary paid much more, attention to traditional channels of, in her campaign. She spent a lot of money, a lot more money than Trump, almost 50% more on her media. But she had 80% less um, exposure because she was not entertaining. In Trump, I can't say that he, he is entertaining because he's not to me but he made some attempt to be outrageous. 
and this gave him lots of um, reposts on in virtual chat rooms and online. Even negative attention in an election campaign can sometimes earn you votes. So I think there should be more um, control in the US about how the campaigns function and you know some um, equality between candidates in how their campaigns are earning media attention. And that's number one. And number two, I think for elections, we should start rethinking our process, maybe having a smaller group of re really educated uh, voters working on elections. Like r thinking about the Athenian model. That, those are just my observations, but I also recommend this book, The Great Regression. It's an excellent book. Thank you. Я сподіваюся, що ми продовжимо наші зустрічі і ваші виступи, ваші лекції, тому що було дуже цікаво, і тематика актуальна, і не просто актуальна, я би сказав, просто болюча, як для українського суспільства, а тепер і для американського суспільства. Дякую дуже, дуже дякую за запрошення. Я запрошую все до офісу Брайта на лекції, на події і на чай. Так, прийде до нас. Дякуємо. Дякую.